Hey guys, it's Ryan. Thanks for tuning into Theology-ish. Before we jump in, I just want to emphasize that the discussions on this podcast are exploratory in nature and delve into a variety of theological perspectives. They do not strictly represent or define our personal stances on the faith nor the doctrine of our affiliated churches. We encourage listeners to reflect, question, and seek guidance from their local church leaders. Thanks for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Theology-ish, your favorite podcast about theology and theology-adjacent subjects. My name is Ryan Kelly, and I am joined, as always, by our co-host, William Barry. It's-a me, William Barry. A wahoo! Yahoo! <laughs> Gonna get copyright it's struck Barry for that. time. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get copyright struck I don't know. so hard. I don't know. It's cool. Nintendo loves when people use their IPs. Oh, they're not infamously yeah. awful about that at all. Yeah, yeah. Nintendo's never, like, sued a dying child with cancer for drawing a picture of Mario. No, that's yeah. definitely never happened. That's not something Nintendo's into. Uh, so, uh, how you doing? I'm doing good. Good. I'm, uh, tired. Hi, tired. I'm William. Ha! 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 Got him! Comedy. Yeah. How are you doing? Uh, I'm all right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Uh, better than not good. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've been trying to fast for Lent, mm. and uh, it's not going super hot. Ah. Uh. But... Sorry to hear that. It's okay. But, it's uh, okay. The Lord doth time. provide, William. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway. We're not uh, talking about We're fasting. not talking about fasting today, although that would have been a good thing for us to talk about in this Lentian season. That would have been. Uh, that probably Maybe next been, time. Probably would have been better, actually. Oh, well. Right now. <laughs> too late. Uh, we're already into Lent, and it's too late to talk about fasting because I didn't prepare to talk about fasting, so we're not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, a question. Um, a buddy of mine, his name's Sean. This one goes out to you, Sean, because he uh, asked me this question a little while ago. He asked me what I thought about missing books in the Bible. And I told him what I thought about the idea that there are missing books from the Bible. And I thought to myself, you know, that would be a great podcast topic. So we're doing this podcast topic because Sean asked me a question. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. This is your fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me if there are missing books of the Bible. And that question has a couple things baked into it. So the first thing that it has baked into it is that there is a thing called the Bible. And that that thing exists unto itself. Okay. I have in my hands here a copy of the Bible. It's bonded leather, black. It's an NRSV version um, it's got gilding on the pages and a nice little ribbon bookmark. I'm sure you've seen a Bible very similar to it before. Um, and when we think about where the Bible came from, we probably have something that looks kind of like this in our head. And we usually don't think about where it came from. But if we were to th just imagine where the Bible came from, we might imagine something that looks very similar to what I have here in my hands just kind of uh falling from the sky just appearing yeah and it's there and that's the bible um and then the question about whether or not there are missing books assumes that there were some people that picked up that thing that fell from the sky and they're usually catholic people and they looked at it and they said hmm this is some really good stuff except this one right here this one right here we don't like it so we're going to and they rip it out. And now it's missing because the Catholics decided that they wanted to get rid of it. Um, all of these things 
in our imagination that we think about when we think about the Bible and whether or not there are missing books are wrong. And I will tell you why they are wrong. They're wrong because the Bible didn't fall out of the sky. That's not what Christians believe about the Bible. That's what Mormons believe about the Book of Mormon, and that's what uh, Muslims believe about the the uh, Quran. The Quran. It is not what Christians believe about the Bible. We believe that the Bible was compiled and written by inspired human authors who were spurred to write the things that they wrote under inspiration by the Holy Spirit. So it is uh, not dictated by God. It is inspired by God. And he used human actors to to write it out with inks and pens and, and pieces of paper. And so the, the Jewish people have the things that they consider scripture, right? And yeah. that would be uh, what we refer to as the Old Testament. So they would call it the law and the prophets. Yep. So they've got the law and the prophets, and that's the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes, and Jesus does Jesus stuff. And the people that really liked Jesus continue to read the law and the prophets. But as the first century goes on, they write some of their own stuff. In particular, Paul writes Paul's stuff. John writes John's stuff. Peter writes Peter's stuff. James writes James. And the authors of the Gospels write the Gospels. And so these things come from these people. And we know, as best as you can know anything about the ancient world, who wrote these things. Um, you know, when dealing with ancient documents, it can get difficult to say who exactly wrote what, but it's... The burden of proof is on you to show that uh, the book of Revelation was actually written by Seneca rather than John. If that's what you think, you need to prove that to me rather than just saying it and me accepting that you're right. Yeah. Okay. So these people that really liked Jesus wrote these things, and those become the New Testament. Now, how do we go from having this collection of the Law and the Prophets and then this collection of stuff that we call the New Testament? How do we go from having these different things to them becoming one thing that we call the Bible? Well, um, basically, all of the churches everywhere for the first hundred years are reading the same things. And we know that all the churches everywhere are reading the same things because we have some documents from that time period. In particular, Clement of Rome's first epistle to the Corinthians— if you read it and read it carefully or at all, you will see all of this stuff that he's referencing. So Clement's writing from Rome to the church in Corinth, and he references all this stuff in the Old Testament and all this stuff from the New Testament. And he's assuming that Christians in Corinth know the same holy works, the same bits of scripture that Christians in Rome know. And he's writing probably around the year 70 or so. Some people will put that date a bit later, around 90 to 100. Um, I think that internal evidence supports that that epistle was written prior to the destruction of the temple in 72 AD. So, Clement of Rome's probably writing before that. Now, the one thing from the New Testament, the one tradition that because we have bits of Peter's stuff is reflected in Clement, bits of Paul's stuff is reflected in Clement, bits of James, bits of the Gospels. The only thing that we don't have reflected in Clement is the Joannian literature. So that's the stuff by John. So that'd be the Gospel of John, the Apocalypse of John, and John 1, 2, and 3. Yep. Or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. No. 
those are not reflected in Clement's epistle, which, if we go for traditional datings for those things, would not have been written until a bit later in that century, around the year between like 80 and 100. Somewhere in there is when John finally sits down and writes his stuff. Yeah. So it tracks that Clement, writing in 70 or so, wouldn't have access to the Joannian literature because it isn't written yet. But otherwise, it is quite clear that Clement assumed that Christians throughout all of the ancient world were reading the Old Testament, were reading the letters of Paul, were reading Peter's epistles, were reading the Gospels, and so on. That's clear from Clement circa 70. Okay. Now, around the year, uh, when is it? I think, I, I want to say about 120. Mm -hmm. We have this guy who is a heretic, and his name is Marcion. Yep. And Marcion is a docetist. We talked about that a little bit. We did. In our episode on heretics. So he has kind of docetist understandings of things. And he says, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be reading all that. And he's kind of like the middle ground between a docetist and a Gnostic. So he's like, you shouldn't be reading the Old Testament because the God in the Old Testament is bad. And we don't like that. So don't read that. We want to read the New Testament. But only parts of the New Testament, because some parts of the New Testament sure are friendly to that God in the Old Testament. So he creates a list of certain letters of Paul's, parts of the Gospel of Luke, and he makes a collection of about, I don't know, it's a few books. It's far smaller than anything that we have. He creates this collection of like 10 or 12 books, and he edits them to make them more favorable to what he's thinking. And he says, this is what Christians ought to read. And the church goes, no. What? What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> so then because some silly guy starts saying that we should be reading certain things and not other things, the church finally comes out and says, no, no, no. This is the list of stuff you ought to read. And the lists that we start getting of the canon are very, very similar, if not identical, to this leather-bound gilded edged thing that I have in front of me with a couple exceptions that we'll get into later. So are you with me so far? Yeah. I'm, oh, excuse me. I'm with you. All right. You're tracking. Yeah. Um, any uh, questions about any of that? Uh, sort of. I wanted to touch on something you said like five minutes ago, Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I was, I was letting you cook, let him cook. All right. Um, all right. You said that, uh, all of scripture is written by human authors who were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the things they wrote. Uh -huh. Did the people of the days of the Old Testament who wrote the law and the prophets, did they did they have the Holy Spirit? Yeah. You think so? I, I think that uh, we can get into that some other day, mm. but it's pretty pretty clear that that's what's going on. There's part of Deuteronomy where Moses, when he ordains Joshua to take over for him, mm -hmm. he lays hands on him and confers his office yeah. via the Holy Spirit. It's very, it's remarkably similar to the the uh, laying of the hands passages that we get in the New Testament about the conference of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's almost exactly the same. Interesting. Um, so I I, okay. I would say yes. I think that um, it seems to be the case that in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit indwelt special people, like it was prophets. Selective. It was more selective, and now it's uh, a freely accessible, freely accessible to whomever. Is if you do Christian. the thing, if it, you is can a Christian have it. and does the thing, and you yeah. you can get access to that um which was not the case in old testament times so. interesting okay yeah that's fair question. Uh, fair question definitely a, a topic we can touch on in more depth in the future because yes. uh, i think that is an interesting thing to discuss because yeah. uh Getting a lot of people i think probably take the approach that uh you know 
the Holy Spirit became accessible to us when Jesus imparted it onto the disciples. And then when he ascended to the heavens, you know, now that's the thing. We we all have access to it through Christ. Um, and and I, I would affirm that with the caveat that it seems to be the case that Holy Scripture teaches us okay. that the Holy Spirit was present and active and doing things prior to Pentecost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, we'll get into that in the future so, in a different episode, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so now we have, we've reached a point where we have canon lists. We have lists of things that are the Bible, which means that things that are not on that list are not the Bible. And by that, I mean Christianity, the church, and its traditions— decided which things belonged and they decided which things belonged based off of the teachings of their predecessors and around the year 120 150 or so when we first start getting canon lists those predecessors are the apostles themselves and the people that knew the apostles so the patristic period of it, authors. Yeah, we're, we're in the patristics still toward the apostolic fathers. So it's, we read this stuff because this is the stuff Polycarp said, John said we should read. Yeah. Yeah. This is the stuff Ignatius of Antioch said we should read. Yep. So we're, we're going with that. Yeah. That's why. Um, so it's, the Bible didn't just flop down and yeah. here it is it was people that knew jesus or knew the people that knew jesus said no 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 the, the iliad's good but it's not job so, the i like the iliad it's nice it's a good poem but we it's not the same as the psalms in other words what you're getting at is scripture and what is defined as scripture was was determined by tradition Yes. Like now, Christian tradition. Um, later, there will be uh, defenses given for why these things in particular, and it will be, especially with the New Testament, because the Old Testament, that's taken care of. That's already written. Whatever. There you go. We do that because that was the Jewish Bible, and we brought it over, um, baptized it, and now it's part of our Christian thing. Um the reason that we choose some books for the New Testament uh, and not others, like the Epistle of Barnabas or whatever, is because we want it to be by either apostles themselves or people that were very, very close affiliates, like Mark was, who wrote the Gospel now, of Mark. I'm just going to throw this out there since we're kind of talking about this sort of thing. Polycarp knew John. They were good buddies. John made him the Bishop of Smyrna. So would his letter and or martyrdom, would would those not be good enough to be considered Holy Scripture by the people? No. And here's our next yes. uh, criteria. Okay. It needs to be um, early. Like if it was not written prior to 100, it's not in the running. Mm. Okay, so we need it to be really early. We need it to be by someone who is an apostle or a very close affiliate to an apostle. We also need it to have uh, universal teachings in it because the Bible's for everybody, right? Yeah. This is for all of the church everywhere. So if we have Polycarp's epistle where he's doing it as a cover letter to this specific church about the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, that's not really a, a universal teaching kind of thing in the same way that the epistle to the Hebrews is. Well, let's um, let's go here then. Uh, I, I know we're probably going to get into how there are a few different canons of what people call the Bible today, uh, and I don't want to jump onto that ship too early before we get there, but for example, the Shepherd of Hermes, which was written... Post the year 100, probably, yeah? If I'm not mistaken. Probably, yeah. And uh, that is not part of 
most canons of scripture. It is, however, part of the Ethiopian Bible still to this day. So do we just kind of take that and say that the Ethiopian canon is wrong? Or how do we how do we approach that? Because apparently, I mean, obviously, a certain part of the church decided that it was good enough and it was orthodox enough to be considered part of Scripture. So in our later canon lists in the third, fourth and century around there, sometimes we'll run into people saying, so they'll give the list of the canon and they'll add the caveat. Some people include the shepherd by Hermas. So at this point, we still kind of have a little bit of fluidity to the canon. But the things that have a little bit of fluidity are uh, sort of regional and very limited. It's not that the canon was open to whatever writings. The canon was open to, if you guys really like the shepherd, if you guys really want to keep that in the library there at your church, you can. That's fine. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, generally, though, overall, the church did not include the shepherd of Hermas in their So it, it's probably safe to say then that the Ethiopian canon just got that one wrong the, more or the less. The Ethiopian canon is uh, far less... Strict? I, I, I was going to say it's far less... Um, what's the nice way to put it? It's less picky. Okay. Not as picky. Okay. And, and we'll, we'll get into um, that a little bit later. Yeah. And All right. So... So let's let's get back on track here. That was a bit of a side tangent, yeah. but so we've got this thing now. That's the Bible, and it's this list. And now we're in the second, third, fourth century, and we've got these. I'm trying to cuss less. <laughs> we've got these fellas that we'll call Gnostics. Okay, we talked about them. They suck in our episode on heresy. The Gnostics are dumb, and the Gnostics start writing things to justify their dumb beliefs. So they write things like the Gospel of Mary, they write the Gospel of Thomas, they write the Gospel of Judas, I think the Gospel of Nicodemus is arguably Gnostic, so they write these things. And now, when you pick up a, an issue of National Geographic that says there are missing books of the Bible, what it's going to point to as missing books of the Bible are those. It's going to say, you, you, the Christian Gnostics had the Gospel of Thomas, and the Catholics stole it from you because they suppressed it, and you, you need to wake up, sheeple. You gotta, you gotta read the Gospel of Thomas. Well, first of all, not by Thomas. Second of all, uh, it's like 300 years late to the party. And lastly, the group that determines what is and is not part of the Bible, that is the, the church, never included the Gospel of Thomas. The church never, even the Ethiopians, thought that the Gospel of Mary belonged. It was never included. So if it was never included by the people that have the right to say what is and is not part of the Bible, then it's not part of the Bible. Yeah, that's that. I, I don't get to decide what belongs in the Quran and what doesn't belong in the Quran because it's not my dat gum book. Yeah. It's not mine. I'm an outsider. I can't say what they should or shouldn't include. The Gnostics were outsiders at this point in particular— they, which is why they start writing their own things, because they're clearly outsiders by now. They don't get to decide what does or does not belong in our book. Yeah. Fair? Fair. So when you pick up the National Geographic or whatever, and it says this stuff belongs to the Bible, and that it's missing. Uh-uh. It's not missing. It wasn't suppressed or hidden from you. It was never, it was never included. part of it. It's not 
part of our thing. So, um, trying to think where I want to go next. So in these canon lists that we have, if you were to sit down and read them, you might be surprised to find out that the Old Testament looks different than that leather-bound KJV that's right in front of you. Yeah. The Old Testament's going to have some extra stuff in it. You're going to notice uh, something called the Book of Tobit. You're going to notice, uh, what else? The Book of Ezra. Yep. Um, Book of Judith, etc. You're going to notice some stuff that's not in your gilded edged Bible that you have in front of you. And that stuff we call the Apocrypha. In those canon lists, they unanimously include the Apocrypha. In our early documents from the Christian church, such as Clement of Rome's epistle, they make references to the Apocrypha. We even have references to the Apocrypha that exist in the New Testament as it is now. That's uh, true. Peter makes reference to it. They were Christians in the first and second and third century were reading this. The disciples, the disciples were reading, were reading it. it. The version of the Bible that so we, we've got that part in one of the Gospels where Jesus picks up the Bible and or he picks up the Old Testament, one of the scrolls, and he reads it there in the in the synagogue. Yep. Um, that version of the Old Testament, if it was the Septuagint, and it probably was, it was certainly the Septuagint when Paul was reading it. Yeah. Um, it had that stuff in there. It had some chapters in the book of Daniel that your KJV that you've got doesn't have. Um, do they belong or not? I don't know. We can debate that. If you want it to be as faithful to it, its earliest possible structure, maybe those chapters don't belong. If you want to read it in the way that Peter and Paul were reading it, those chapters better be in there. Yeah, so um, do you want to tell us why those aren't in your gilded leather Bible anymore? What happened? Why are those gone? Martin Luther stole them from you, uh, to <laughs> keep it short. So in those canon lists that we have from the 3rd, 4th century, the people that write those lists down will often be clear that they hold the Apocrypha to be Scripture, to be good, and to not be on the same level as the likes of the Psalms. They're worth reading. They're good. They're not on the same level as the other stuff, though. And I've read some of them, and by golly, I think they're right. They're good. They're worth reading. Not the same as the Psalms. Um, and Luther, for reasons that I'm not entirely sure of, decided that he didn't want those. And the rest of Protestantism said, yeah, up yours, Catholic Church, and they got rid of them. So that's why you don't have it anymore. If you have a Catholic Bible, you're probably still going to have the Apocrypha. You're going to have the longer chapters to Daniel. It, it's going to be a little different. And um, so there you go. Do you think it should still be there then? Do you think that these could genuinely be considered missing books of the Bible? Ought those be in the Protestant Bible? They're not missing, though. They're right over there. Go grab them. Well, like, <laughs> they're missing I, from the I Protestant I have three copies of Bible. it at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you go to a Protestant church, though, they are missing. You don't have those. Ought they be in the Protestant Bible? I, I think that um, the idea of them as missing implies that they're, like, secret. Lost. They're lost. They're not secret or lost. They're just not part of your tradition. Removed. They've been put in a different volume on the same shelf. Right? Yeah. Because I'll— Go to your pastor's office at your church. He probably has a copy of the Apocrypha somewhere on his bookshelf. Yeah. He probably has it. He's aware of it. He knows about it. It's not lost. 
it's not missing. It's just not included with it mm-hmm. anymore. Um, same thing with like the Shepherd of Hermas. And I want you to close your eyes real quick and imagine that in the back of your Bible, after the maps, yeah, perhaps the publisher might include uh, an excerpt from Martin Luther King Jr.'s prison letters. Okay. Or um, they might include an article by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or they mm-hmm. might include uh, some quotes from Lewis or Chesterton or yeah. something. It's good stuff, and it's worth reading. But it's clearly not it's not on the same level. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And I think it's fair to say that the church generally throughout its history had that attitude towards the Apocrypha and towards the likes of the Shepherd of Hermas. It's good. It's worth reading. Maybe even include it in your publication of the Bible. But it's not script. But it, it well, they might even use holy the word scripture. scripture. They might even use the word holy scripture. But it, it's not uh, the same level of like inerrant, ineffable, mm-hmm. uh, inspired holy word of God. It's not like that same peak. Yeah, you've got peak Bible, and then like you know. Pretty, little B Bible. Pretty good Bible. We've got capital uh, B Bible and little B Bible. Sure, why not? And the Apocrypha's little B Bible. Um, so as far as those are concerned, are they really missing? Eh. No, I, I don't think okay. they count yeah. and as I, missing. I think that's fair because, you know, I've read The Shepherd of Hermas a couple of times. Uh, I haven't read the Apocrypha. I want to. I think it would be I've read parts of it. Yeah, I think it would be good just to just to do. But uh, I've read the Shepherd of Hermes. It's good. I really like it. I think it's a great read. I I think that it was uh, beneficial in some ways for me to read. I learned some stuff. I I thought about things that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise, and that's that's a good thing, or at least yeah. it can be a good thing. And uh, that's fine and dandy, but. By golly, it's not Psalms. I I think that um, there's an idea that we can get into a headspace similar to the early church Mm -hmm. when we read the Gospels, that we can get into this headspace. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about Jesus in the same way that they were thinking about Jesus. No, you're not. And insofar as you can do that, sure, whatever. But you're definitely, almost certainly not doing that if you haven't at least read the Apocrypha. If you're not at least familiar with the Apocrypha, you cannot approach the New Testament like a second temple Jew. You're not going to be able to do it because they had the Apocrypha. Yeah. So it it has a lot of value for us um, when it comes to approaching Scripture. And there are references that, like Peter makes, that you— you wouldn't catch it. It would just go right over your head if you aren't familiar with the material that he's referencing. Yeah, you. So it, you it can't adds depth think scripture. about scripture or the church the same way Clement of Rome did without reading the Shepherd of Hermas because we knew that well, uh, he probably not the Shepherd of Hermas. That was after Clement, but you do need to read Judith. Well, wasn't it wasn't it in the Shepherd of Hermas that uh, the angel of repentance tells him to write this stuff down and then give it to Clement of Rome? Isn't isn't that yeah, a that's thing? part of the shepherd? But so th- the epistle was definitely written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm shepherd. saying that it is. It's likely. I, I'm going. To, I'm going to assume Clement got it. That he probably yeah, read it. Probably. I think that's a fair assumption to make. Uh, we know people at the time were reading it. Yeah. You you can't think about the church or or God the same way that the people of that time did. If you aren't reading the same things they did and understanding the same things they did. And that's it, not to it'll say certainly that, help. Yeah, that's not to say that the shepherd is on the same level as scripture because it's not. But you can't understand it the same way that they did or think about it the same way they did if you're not reading the same stuff. Yeah. You just can't. Um, it, it adds depth and new dimensions to the... The rest of uh, I Bible. think it's fair to say in, in the same vein, you can't think about God the same way your local church pastor does. 
who has read a lot of C.S. Lewis if you yourself have not read C.S. Lewis. You aren't um, thinking about God the same way this, that your pastor has if your pastor has read, you know, The Four Loves by, by Lewis if you haven't read The Four Loves by Lewis. I, I think to some degree you can. Um, you don't have to be literate to be a good Christian. No, Even to be a good saying. theologian. Uh, but it, it will help you track more. It, it's kind of a shortcut. Yeah, it's it's a shortcut to being on the same page is for you to read the same things. If you're gonna get um, into the headspace of your local pastor, you ought to be involved in the same kind of things that your local pastor is, because by golly, you know, I can't relate to my local pastor and the outreaches that he does if I also don't try to do outreach. Yeah, you on, know what I mean. On some level, with the reading thing, I I think it is good for us to have. Uh, if we all read the same thing that our pastor reads, then we're going to get real homogenous real quick, and it would be easy for us to all slide a little to the left or a little to mm-hmm. the right at the same time and not even notice because we're all tracking at the same time. So it's good for us to have yeah. diversity of interest. But um, by golly, you'll probably have a better understanding of why your pastor thinks the way they do. Because you read the thing they're reading and go, ah, oh, that's where he got that from. Yeah. That's where that idea came from. You know what I mean? Uh, um, there's a fella named Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr wrote like a, around the year 150-ish. Feels like a disservice to call him just a fella. <laughs> he, he was a, a great apologist. And yeah. ultimately, in case his name didn't give it away... A martyr. A martyr. He gets beheaded. Around 157, I want to say. Anyway, Justin Martyr had a fella that he taught, that he discipled, whose name was Tatian. And Tatian looked at the Gospels, all four of them, and he said, sure is interesting that we have four of them instead of one of them. And it sure is interesting that some of these things say different things about different things and have things a little bit out of order. I bet I could take them and smush them together and make them not have these chronological dis- these chronological contentions. Yeah, make one gospel. Make one gospel. And he called it the diatessaron, which is something like uh, according to the four or whatever. Well, uh, Polycarp, he had a fella that he taught whose name was Irenaeus. We've mentioned him before on the show, Irenaeus of Lyon. Cool guy. Yeah. And he wrote a book called Against Heresies. It's a, a long book, about 500 something pages, where he talks about Gnostics and why, and other heretics and why they suck. And one of the things that he comes down really hard on is Tatian and his diatessaron. Mm -hmm. Because there are four Gospels. Four means four. Yeah. It is not five Gospels. It is not three Gospels. It is four. And Irenaeus is uh, glad and thankful that there are these little discrepancies in them. And he's like, hey, check it out. This is... um, This is, at the very least, proof that the Gospels were not a conspiracy. Yeah. If it was a conspiracy, they would have met together and gotten their story straight before writing it down. Not only that, but we get... uh, He has some mystical reasons that are interesting for why there are four of them, because there are four cardinal directions and the four winds, and it's interesting stuff that's not particularly relevant here. But what is particularly relevant is that around the year 180... When Irenaeus is writing, there are four Gospels, and only four that are recognized by the Church. And that is exceedingly clear by the year 180. So, when we have National Geographic or whoever else saying that there are missing books, and usually they'll point to the Gospel of Mary or whatever. No, it's not. It's not missing. Um... Yeah, so really, the closest we do get is 
the Septuagint with Protestant the, Bibles. The, the, the Apocrypha. Or the Apocrypha, thank you. Yes. Uh, the Apocrypha with Protestant Bibles would be the closest you could really get to calling something, quote-unquote, lost to the Bible. But even then, it's it's right there. Yeah. It's really not lost. You can go read that. Not thing. lost, not missing. We didn't misplace it. We know where it's at. We took it out on purpose. Yeah, and uh, there you Catholics go. left it there on purpose. The Catholics purpose. left it there on purpose, and I, I think that they were probably right to do so. Mm -hmm. um, like, let's be honest, man. Uh, if we left the Apocrypha in here, made this bad boy 500 pages extra longer— Boy, howdy. Are we in a whole lot of danger of people actually reading that? Those uh, read the Bible in a year plans are going to get a whole lot more difficult. <laughs> yeah, but like, most Christians don't read this thing anyway. <laughs> it's not going to hurt anything to to put top it back in there. In reality. <laughs> <laughs> people aren't going to get misled by that. The sort of person that's gung-ho enough to read through the whole thing and be confused by the weird stuff that's in Tobit or... Uh, the book of Judith or whatever, if they get confused by it. Rough. Yeah, and then, then then their pastor can set them right, uh, make it less confusing. Uh, yeah, so I, I uh, how are we on time? We've got like 20 minutes left. Is there anything else you have to say about like missing books or any questions about anything we've gone over or like... Uh, I, I guess else? the question would be in regards to stuff like the Ethiopian canon. Mm, yeah. So do we just kind of say that canon's wrong? Is that the approach we take with that? Or do we say that's what they decided and that's good for them? You know, how, how do we approach that? Because, again, clearly some Christians thought that those things were good enough to be considered canon. So the second epistle of Peter was, I think, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but I want to say that it was kept in Antioch. Okay. And that for a while it was kind of a local thing for Antioch that they they kept it and it was their special thing. Yeah. They got an epistle from Peter at some point and they've safeguarded it for 200 years now. They've had it. And the rest of the church is like, "Geez. That's neat. You you guys have your own extra book." And it's not creating problems for anyone. Yeah. It's like, well, they've got an extra book. Cool. Can we look at it? You mind if I make a copy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and they let people make copies of it and look at it. And over time, when we come up with those criteria that it has to be by an apostle or a close associate, that it has to be early prior to 100, that it has to have a universal appeal, universal applicability to it and then i think there's a fourth one that i don't recall um by golly it checked out it's not in contrast with anything else doctrinally it doesn't create any problems there's not any heresy so we slap it on in there and now we've got another book in the bible sweet and that's <laughs> and that's fine if the bible is something that church tradition is dictating rather than something that's falling out of the sky. If the Bible's something falling out of the sky, we can't... We can't change We it. can't change it, but that's not what happens. So the church as a whole could make that call. And there was a time when the church as a whole was homogenous enough to make that decision. We wouldn't be able to do that anymore. We have too much fracturing on things. Yeah. Um, at the time, that was a, a possible thing for Christianity to decide on. It's no longer possible. So I, I would say that the canon is now uh, pretty firmly closed, as it is. But the Ethiopian church had their weird canon um, while they were still in full communion with the rest of the church. And the rest of the church wasn't afraid of that. Yeah. Just like they weren't afraid of Second Peter. They were like, you know, I, I don't think that all this stuff belongs. But if you guys want to read it, that's fine. And they were cool with it. Which is a very different picture than the Catholic Church of antiquity in the Middle Ages that were usually given by pop culture. Because it's usually like draconian and like, yeah. toe the line or get burned, heretic. And yeah. That's... Not 
usually how it went most of the time. It was like, well, what, what are you reading over there? I got uh, some extra books in my Bible. Well, what, what do they say? If I, uh, what if I copy that? And then you look at it and you're like, neat. I don't really care for it, but uh, it's fine. Go off. And that's what happened with Ethiopia. And yeah. It, it's fine. It's, as long as the Bible didn't just fall out of heaven, if it's not a divine sneeze, it's okay to have that sort of uh, diversity. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm game with that. Yeah. And, and so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I've, I've, I've really got nothing else of uh, importance to say, I feel like. I feel like we pretty pretty much covered that. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I hope this has been helpful. I don't I don't have anything else to say. It, yeah. Are there missing books of the Bible? No. No. Can uh, can we add more books to the Bible? No. no. Uh, what if we found a manuscript that appeared to be genuine that was by Paul or one of the apostles or something? Could we add that? No. Because it's it's closed now. We have closed the canon. We, we've closed the canon. We're not going to add anything else. I don't want anyone taking anything out of it. Um, yeah. I, I'm not super glad that Luther took the things out that he did. Uh, I'm sure he had reasons that he thought were good and reasons that other Protestants also thought were good. But... Um, yeah. I don't know if we should be doing that. So I guess what I'd say then is uh, if you are a Protestant and you're interested in the Apocrypha or in some of the stuff from the Ethiopian canon, like the Shepherd of Hermas, it's not lost. It, it's not lost to your Bible. It's, uh, it's right there. Go read it. Uh, if you're interested in it, go read it. There's nothing stopping you. And uh, whether or not you consider it to be part of biblical canon, I think you'll find that most of these things are at the very least a good read, and they can be beneficial for your faith in one way or another. Uh, whether or not they are divinely inspired words of God, that doesn't mean they can't be good, just because they're about God and because they have valuable things to say. So if you're if you're sad about Luther taking away your Apocrypha, or you're sad that the Shepherd of Hermas didn't make it into your traditions canon, you can you can it, still go read it. I don't think that the uh, Shepherd of Hermas should have made it into no, your No, and canon. that's fine. But if you think it should have and you're sad you don't have it, it's, it's right there. Go read it. There's there's no one and nothing stopping you from doing that because you Actually, uh, I'm, I'm looking here. Yeah? And I, I don't think the Shepherd of Hermas is in the Ethiopian canon. What? Yeah, it's not in there. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh man, we were wrong about that. Well, you were wrong about that. Yeah. I never said that it was in their canon. I had heard somewhere that that was part of their canon. Um, so our oldest codex, which yes. that's what your codex modern Sinaiticus. Yeah, your modern books used to be called codexes because you had scrolls that were a big long piece of paper that you rolled up after writing on it, and then. Uh, after people realized that that was kind of a silly way to store a lot of book, they started doing pages that they would sew together, and that was called the Codex. Our oldest Codex of the Bible is called the Codex Sinaiticus, and the Codex Sinaiticus is, uh, it includes the Shepherd of Hermas. It's from, like, the late 4th, early 5th century, somewhere in there, um, and it includes the Shepherd. That said, your Bible shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the shepherd's worth reading. I but guess it's, I will not publicly apologize there. to the Ethiopian Church. My bad. I got that one wrong. Uh, I had heard somewhere that that was part of their canon, so I don't remember where I heard that. But I probably should have vetted that before I actually said anything. It's but fine. it happens. Yeah. In looking at the Wikipedia page, it appears that uh, they're only have like one two, three four, they only have like six okay. uh books in their bible that are not common to any other denomination okay so it's not like they have a ton a ton 
And I, I have no idea what the content of those other books are. So either way, mm, if, oh. if you are interested in the Apocrypha, in the Shepherd, in the books of the Ethiopian canon, and you're sad that those aren't part of your Bible, they're, they're right there. Just go read them. Yeah, and you can read them and make your own determination about their validity as scripture. No, absolutely not. Well, no, I'm saying you can do that. I'm not saying you should. The church has decided what the scripture is, and you will capitulate to the traditions of the church because you're not a cowboy. Christianity is about the thing that we're doing together. You don't get to decide for yourself which things belong in the Bible and which things don't. So the church decided what belongs in the canon, and that is what the canon is. So then you're saying that if you go to a Baptist church, you you can't believe that the Apocrypha should be canon? Uh, I, because the, the, the Baptist church decided the Apocrypha is not part of canon, but the Catholics still think it is. So is it wrong for me to go read the Apocrypha and then decide, you know what, I think that should be in there? I think that it would be internally incongruent for you to do that. Mm. If you decide that the Apocrypha does in fact belong in the canon, then... You should probably go to a church that would affirm that. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about like it, it's it's shouldn't be personal discretion. No. Things and it. I'm not saying that that's what you were saying. That's but not that's what, what I was trying to get like. at. Yeah. It sounded like you decide on personal discretion what is and is not canon, and that's not it at all. No, I was getting at if you read the things that are parts of other canons from different traditions, and you decide that that makes more sense based on what that tradition says about those things, and because you read it and you agree, that there's room for that because the Catholics do think the Apocrypha is canon, and the Baptists don't. So there's room for you to read the Apocrypha and go, yeah, the Catholics were right about that one. You know what I mean? I, I mean, your Baptist friends might disagree. Well, sure. But <laughs> as, as a non-Baptist, I have no problem with that. Um, I'm not saying you as an individual decide what the canon is. I'm saying you have the capacity to look at the varying canons and decide for yourself which one you think is the most correct. Yeah, you, you could read Judith and say— is it harmful for us to include this in yeah. our publications of the Bible? And the answer is probably no. Almost certainly no. There's there's not anything in Judith that's any worse than anything that's in Judges. There's some stuff in Tobit that's weird. Uh, and, you know, do with that what you will. Yeah. But there's some stuff in uh, lots of other places in the Bible that's also weird. Yeah, so there you go. If you want to read the stuff, Read the stuff. There's no one stopping you. Yeah. And um, that's that's the last thing I have to say about that. It's right there. If you want to read it, go read it. Not missing, not secret, not hidden, not a hole in the Bible. None of that stuff. It's just not in your Bible. Not maybe. part of it. It's either not part of the canon and has never been part of the canon, or it was part of the canon but understood to be lesser than the rest of the canon. In the words of Mace Windu, on the council, but not granted the rank of master. Yes. And it might just not be part of your particular tradition, and that's okay. It's okay. It, the The amount of Bible that we Protestants get is a good amount of Bible. It sure is. It, it's a, there's plenty there. <laughs> we, we can get the cores of Christian doctrine perfectly well from those 66 books, um, but it might be productive and helpful for you to go read some of those other ones if you're interested if not that's fine but uh that's, that's all we have to say about that i think um, so yeah thanks for listening thanks for tuning in don't forget to like comment and subscribe leave a five-star review uh email us at theologyish at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments about anything check out uh, the website check out stuff yeah, on there the website uh links in the description uh, are we going to add games on the website uh, you know, I, I've got the little community tab up there where I, I'm going to use for, like, announcements and that kind of thing. Um, you can put up, like, polls and stuff like that on there. I'm like, hey, maybe but, but can we, we get do, big enough we can do little games. Can we, we put Tetris on there? 
I think that might be copyright infringement, but we we could we could do like a, a rip off Tetris. <laughs> uh, uh, Tetrogrammatronus. That was a terrible joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know how I feel about making a Tetris ripoff game out of the unutterable name of God. Well, uh, anyway, uh, keep your eye on the website. There might be some fun, weird, interactive stuff on there at some point. Um, that's it from us, though. We could do like listening. a tower defense game, like Plants vs. Zombies, but it's like heretics versus orthodoxy or something we're gonna cut that off there that, we'll see you guys uh that and and you have to like <laughs> throw uh, i don't know the elements of the eucharist at them we'll throw you. holy water there's a holy water cannon to defend you from the heretics that could be fun we'll see you guys next week thanks for tuning in and uh keep your eye out for any theology ish copyrighted video games all right thanks see you later bye